Good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and today is the seventeenth of uh, February, two thousand and twenty-two. Right now, I am with the ninth, uh, with, with the sorry, eleventh Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is uh, physics five zero five four. Today, we have set our hearts to solve a uh, alternative to practical. ATP paper. We have selected October, November, two thousand and twenty-one uh, four two paper. This paper four belongs from the zone two, or you can say this belongs from the variant two. So uh, this paper has uh, the time allowed for this paper is one hour, and there will be four questions in this paper. So let's start this paper. So this is that paper. This is October, November, two thousand twenty-one. Four two paper. Time allowed one hour. We call it paper four. Alter alternative to practical. And here comes first question. He says, uh, he says a student measures a value for the specific heat, a latent heat of vaporization, LV of water. The student pours 100 gram of water at room temperature into a beaker placed on a top pan balance. Connects an immersion heater into a circuit with a suitable power source, an ammeter, and a switch. Places the immersion heater into the water, reads and records the mass of the beaker and the water. The apparatus uh, shown in the figure, apparatus shown in the figure, one point one. So here you can see we have a power supply. Here is the switch. Here is the ammeter. Here are the connecting leads. Here is that heater which has been immersed in the water. And here is a, tri a tripod stand. Uh, sorry, here is the retort stand. And this is the top pan balance. So the top pan balance can tell you what is the mass of the mass of this uh, water. So on the figure one point one, draw a voltmeter connected to measure the potential difference V across the heater. So if you want to find out the uh, the voltage uh, voltage drop across this heater, so we will uh, we will connect a heater uh, parallel to the We will connect a voltmeter connect uh, parallel to the heater. So that's the question number one, and it's a part one mark question. So let me show you. Okay, so here we go. This is the question number one, a part. You can see here I have shown a voltmeter which has been connected, and that voltmeter has been connected. Parallel uh, to the heater. So okay, so let's go to the next part. The next part is, he says, uh, the student closes the switch. The student closes. Uh, that's the B part. The student closes the switch. The scales of the voltmeter and the ammeter are shown in the figure. Record the readings from the ammeter scale. Uh, from the meter scale, so this is uh, you can see here. So this is ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So the reading on the voltmeter is thirteen point five volt, and the reading on the ammeter is you can see this is four, this is five, so this is four point six. So the reading on the ammeter is four point six ampere, and the reading on the voltmeter is thirteen point five volt. So let me show you. So this is how you will note down your answers. Okay. So let's go to the next part. The next part coming up on your screen is he says. Sorry. The student. Uh, that's the C part. The student. Uh, the student. Uh, Waits a few minutes until the water starts to boil. Records the reading on the top pan balance when the water starts to boil and starts a stop clock. Records the reading on the top uh, top pan balance every minute for for six minutes. Open the switch. 
the students' results are shown in the figure 1.3 and in the table 1.1. So the mass of the beaker and water at the room temperature is 154.5 gram. When he put the uh, uh, the beaker on the top pan balance, he notes down that the when the temperature of the water is at the room temperature. He note down that the mass of the water is 154.5 gram. And mass of the beaker and water when the water starts to boil. So he heated the beaker, he switched on the heater. So the temperature of the water rises. So and when the water gains the uh, he the water attains the temperature of the 100 degrees centigrade, up till that time, some of the water had disappeared. Now the mass of the water is 152.3 grams. So it means that some of the water has disappeared, it has evaporated. So when the water started boiling, uh, at till that point, only 152.3 gram water is left. Here is a table and he says that here the table time in minutes, mass of the beaker and the water, mass M of the water boiled away. Okay, so when the time is zero, the, the mass of the beaker is 152.3. So the mass which has disappeared uh, or it has evaporated or it has gone into the gaseous form, that's zero. So when the time is one minute, when the time is one minute, uh, the mass will be 150.9. That's the reading coming on the top and balance. So how much mass has kind of boiled away? Uh, from this mass, subtract the initial mass. When the time is two, uh, the mass of the water, the reading coming on the top and balance is 149.1 gram. So how much mass totally has uh, uh, boiled away? So initial mass, 152.3 minus 149.1. So you get 3.2 grams, water has uh, boiled away. So uh, he says, complete the table 1.1 by filling in the values of the mass, M of the water boiled away at the time T is equal to three. So we have to fill uh, this, this, this column, this reading here. So I will one, uh, 152.3, which was the initial mass and minus the present mass, that is 147.4 gram. So 152.3 gram minus 147.4 gram. So whatever the reading comes, just enter it here. So let me show you, I have done this on the paper and here we go. So uh, 152.3 minus 147.4 gram, and that will give you a reading of 4.9 gram. It means the 4.9 gram uh, water has boiled away. So, okay, so then the question is, on the grid provided in the figure 1.4 on the page five, plot a graph of mass M in grams on the Y axis against the time T in minutes on the X axis. Draw the best fit straight line. It's a four mark question. That's the question number C and its second part. So uh, my dear students, what we will do, uh, so she here, what I will do, this is, uh, let me show you first of all from the page, that this is that diagram. This is that figure 1.4 on the page number five, and we have to draw. On the x-axis, we will take the, uh, the time, and on the y-axis, we will take the mass. You see, your readings are going from, uh, in the time, they are going from zero to six minutes, and on the y-axis, you have to represent the mass, and the maximum reading is going up to 9.7, which is approximately 10. So first of all, I will uh, label label uh, that those, both the axes, and uh, let me show you. Okay, so from here you can see I have labeled this x axis one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So so 
So we will label both the axes, and for that purpose, I will write here uh, one, two, three, four, five, and the six. And here I will write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And here I will write uh, the mass in grams. Here on the x-axis, I will write time in minutes. So I will use this table. I will use this table. You see this this table. At zero, the uh, zero comma zero that will be the first point. One comma one point four that will be the second point. Two comma three point two that's the third point. Three comma four point nine and then four comma six point seven. Five comma eight point one and six comma nine point seven. So these are the points I will plot on the graph. And you can see I have plotted those graphs and then I have joined them with a straight line. This is the line of best fit. So this is uh, this question is of the four marks and I hope you understand how, how, this, is, how this is done. So then in the second, uh, then the, after this, he says, uh, let me read the question. Uh, once we have plotted that uh, graph, that's the second part. D part is determine the gradient G of your line. Show your working, indicate on the graph the values you use. So G, we have to find out the G value. Let me show you how this is done. Okay. So on the graph, I will take two points. For example, I take this point and this point. I join them with the straight line, with the lines. And you can see these blue lines, they make a triangle. So this is my rise, this is my run. And you know the gradient is equals to the rise divided by run. And this is 3.8 divided by 2.4. And it's 1.58. So 1.58 is the gradient, the G value. And this is basically mass divided by time. So it's kind of the rate of uh, how much rate of the mass which is which is boiling away. Okay. So then, then we have uh, this is that diagram. We are done with the D part. <clears throat> e part. He says use your reading from this to calculate the thermal energy Q supplied to the water in one minute using the equation. So here, where the T is 60 seconds. So Q is equals to VIT, and I will put the voltage value, I value, and T value. T value is here in the question, he says is supposed to be taken as 60 seconds, and the V and the I value is the value which we got on the ammeter and the voltmeter. So I will put those values here, and I will do the calculation. So let me show you. So uh, the V value is 13.5 volt and the I value is 4.6 ampere and the, and the time is 60 seconds. So you multiply them, you get 3726 joules. 3726 joules. Then it says use your answer from the D and the E first part to calculate a value for a specific latent heat of vaporization of the water using the equation LV is equal to Q by G. So this is that question. Let me, let me show you the question from the question paper also. So this is the question, second part. So we have to find out the latent heat of vaporization, specific latent heat of vaporization of water. And the equation is LV is equal to Q by G. The Q value we just calculated and G is the gradient of that graph, okay? So I can find out that value very easily. Let me show you. So this is that value 370, 3726 divided by 1.58. The Q value is 3726 and the G value is 1.58. So the final answer will be 2358 joules per gram. Two, 1,358 joules per gram. Hopefully you understand. Okay, so, so let's move to the next part. He says, 
the students result in the sea show that the mass of the beaker and the water just as the water starts to boil is less than the mass of the beaker and water at the room temperature explain the difference in the mass you see when you started your exper experiment uh, let me show you this is given here there's a statement when the temperature is at the when the temperature of the water is at the room temperature and the mass of the water was 154.5 grams and when he started uh, heating it when the temp the water reaches the temperature of 100 degrees centigrade the temperature the mass of the water was only 152.3 grams so some of the water has uh, boiled away uh, or you can say it has disappeared it has not boiled away basically it has disappeared so where it went because you know you are the water evaporates all the time and you are heating it so why there is a difference of some mass of the water because some water has evaporated okay so let me show you my answer so the question is why is there difference between the mass of the water okay so let me show you so the uh, when the water was at the room temperature the mass of the water was 155 154.5 grams and when the water reached the 100 degree centigrade the, the mass of the water was 152.3 grams so there is a 2.2 gram of the water is not there it has disappeared so basically what ha what happened there is 2.2 gram of the water has evaporated during the heating so 2.2 gram of the water has evaporated. Okay, so he says the next question is G part, question number one G part. He says thermal energy is lost by conduction through the sides of the beaker during the experiment. This means that the value determined by the alvi in this experiment is greater than, than the expected value. Explain how the loss of energy through the sides of the beaker causes this difference. You see the energy which is lost through the sides and went into the surrounding. And due to this, what happens? The, the value of the G, the value of the G will be smaller. And the mass uh, divided by time, that value, the gradient of that curve and that graph the G value will decrease because less mass will be uh, boiling away. So, because the heat is lost to the surrounding through the sides. So, when the G value will be less, the LV value was uh, the Q divided by the G value. So, the, when the G value will be smaller, the L value calculated by that formula will be automatically more than the actual value. Okay? Because the LV was equal to the Q divided by G. If the G value is smaller, which is the denominator in that formula. So if the G value will be smaller, the LV value will be larger. So uh, the LV value, which we calculated is more than the actual value. So let me show you my written answer. So um, because the heat is lost to the surrounding by the size of the beaker, the G value is smaller. The rate of uh, boiled away, the mass of the boiled away water, it is less, okay? So LV was Q by G. So if the G is in the denominator, if the G value will be smaller automatically, the LV value will become greater. So the LV value is more than the actual value, okay? So uh, this is my answer, okay? The value of the G is smaller, so the LV value is greater. Okay, so the next part is, he says, state how the loss of thermal energy can be reduced. If you want to reduce the loss of the thermal energy, the process is very simple. Uh, you can do the lagging by wrapping insulating material on the side, on, around the beaker, plus uh, under the beaker. So you can do the lagging with the insulating material. Let me show you my written answer. Um, lag the sides and bottom of the beaker with the insulating material. So that was the question number one and it's a G part. 
Okay, so let's move to the next question. The next question is coming question number two. But before you go to the question number two, I will say, okay, so here we have the whole of the, this is question number uh, one, this marking scheme is showing up on your screen. Uh, one good thing you can do, you can pause the video and uh, take time and read this marking scheme very carefully. I have already checked my answers with this marking scheme. You see, to check the answers with the marking scheme is a very, very important habit. So pause the video and take your time and read this marking scheme. Compare the answers given by me or by your teacher or by yourself with the marking scheme. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next part. Here we go. Question number two. A student uses a three thirty centimeter ruler graduated in millimeters to estimate the thickness of a sheet of paper by two different methods. Method number one, the student takes one sheet of paper from a pack of hundred uh, from a pack of hundred centimeters. Uh, so a pack of 500 sheets and fold it in half. Folds the paper in half again. Repeats this process until the paper has been folded in half five times. Mayer records the thickness of the folded sheet. Uh, so thickness of the folded paper is 0 0.4 centimeter. The folded sheet is now 32 sheets of paper thick. Calculate the mean thickness of one sheet of paper. The procedure is very simple. You know the thickness of the paper and you know the number of folds. You divide the number of the, you divide the thickness with the number of the folds. You get the mean thickness of the one sheet. So let me show you. Okay. So you can see 0 0.4 divided by 32 and you get 0 0.0125 centimeter. 0 0.4 centimeter divided by the 32. So you get 0 0.0125 centimeters. So this is how you will do the question number two and it's A part. So we have the method number two, the student takes the remainder of the pack of paper and measures the thickness of the entire pack, repeats the measurement twice more, more at different places around the edge of the pack. The student's results are 4.3 centimeter, 4.4 centimeter, 4.3 centimeter. Calculate the mean thickness of the pack and give your answer to two significant figures. Okay, so I will find how, how do we find the mean? We add these three values and whatever is their sum, we divide it with the three. So this is how you find the thickness. It's a two marks question. So let me show you. So uh, we will find the, uh, the mean and thickness and that will be add the three readings and whatever the answer you get, you divide it with the three. So 4.3 plus 4.4 plus 4.3 uh, equals to divided by three equals to and you get 4.3 centimeter. So because we have to give the answer in two significant figures, the actual reading is 4.3333. 4, 4 but we will write only two significant figures and that will be 4.3 centimeter. Then he says, calculate the mean thickness of one sheet of paper because uh, uh, there are 30. That's the method number two. Okay. So because we have used uh, how many sheets of paper? 499. And we want to find the thickness of the one sheet. So uh, the 499 sheets, uh, the thickness is 4.3. So what will be the thickness of one sheet? That will be 4.3 divided by 499. So your answer will be 0 0.086. 0 0.086 centimeter. Mean thickness of one sheet is 0 0.086 centimeter. So that is question number two and it's B part. Now the, he says, uh, 
State which method of measuring the mean thickness of a sheet of paper is more accurate? Give one reason for your answer. I think the method number two will be more accurate and the method as compared to the method number one, because in method, method number one, when you folded the paper uh, five times, and then uh, when it's folded like that, it's very difficult to make that folded paper flat. You cannot squash that paper and make a flat paper after the folds. So I think that will be not that accurate. And the method number two will be more accurate. So that's question number two C part. And that's the last part of that. that uh... Okay. So you will have... Uh... Okay. So in method one, it is difficult to squash the folded paper into a flat paper. Method two is that's why more accurate. So this is question number two, which is done. Let me show you the marking scheme. The question number two's marking scheme is showing up on your screen. You can pause the video and you can take your time and read this marking scheme very carefully. Also compare my answers, your answers, your teacher's answers with the marking scheme. And it's a very, very important habit for a all hours a student to check the answers from the marking scheme. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next part. Question number, this is question number, I think question number three, a student, okay. A student uses pins to locate the image of an object formed by a plane mirror. The student places an object P. Uh, the student places an object, in, uh, object, an object pin P in front of a mirror, looks into the mirror and sees an image of the P, places two more pins W and X in front of the mirror and adjust their position so that the image of the P and the pins W and X are exactly in line, one behind the other. The position of the pins is shown in the figure 3.1. So here we have the pin, um, pin P, here we have two more pins, and we are looking from here, and pin X, pin W, and the image of the pin P, they appears to be the, uh, in aligned, they appears to be one, when you look at from here, okay? So then his question is, without moving the object pin P, the student views the image of the P from a different position and repeats the procedure with two more pins Y and Z. And the positions of all the pins is shown in the figure 3.2. So here you can see in this diagram, the pin X and the pin Y is shown. And then this pin Y and the, sorry, pin X is shown, pin Y and pin Z is also showing. So you looked here from through here and you saw that pin and you looked from here and you saw that pin and you put these points, okay. So now we have four pins in front of the mirror, uh, X and Y and Z and W and the pin P is the object, okay. So the question is, on the figure 3.2, draw a line joining X to W and continue the line until it hits the mirror. Label the point where the line meets the mirror with the letter A. Repeat this for the point Z and Y. So let me show you. So we will join uh, X, and, uh, X and W with each other until they, they, they touch the mirror. You can see this red line. Then he says, do the same with the Y and Z. I will join the Y and Z until they touch the mirror. Okay, so then what he says? Then he says, uh, label the point where this line meets the mirror with the letter B, okay. So where these lines, where these lines, when you join Z, Y with the mirror, when it cuts the mirror, uh, you will put a D there. You join the X and the W with the mirror, where this line cuts the mirror, you wrote here A, you label them.
this is that full diagram. I hope you can see that. Okay. So then what this is? This is, okay, uh, label the point where this line meets the mirror with the letter B, we are done with that. And then he says on the figure 3.2, draw the two, two incident rays from P that produce the reflected rays that you have drawn in the first part. Measure the angle of incidence I of the P ray P A. And okay, so let me show you that part. He says, Okay, so we have to draw the incident rays. Incident rays, will, these are the, these dark green color lines starting from P and where it touched the, this point where the reflected ray is touching the mirror. And this is that second ray, which is uh, light blue. And it touched the mirror at this point where this line cuts the, in the mirror. So this green line and the light green line, both are, we have drawn. So then he says, uh, so we are done. We have also, he, he says, measure the angle of incidence of the re, re P, P A. So we will measure the angle of incidence. So here you can see I have drawn a normal and this is the angle of incident between the incident ray and the normal. So what we will do, uh, I will measure this with the help of the scale. I have measured it and it's approximately 45 degree. So, so here I have written I is equal to 45 degree. On the figure 3.2, continue the rays W, X, and the Y, Z. Z, Y until they meet behind the mirror. This is the position of the image. Label the position of the image with the letter I. So let me show you. So what we have done, we have prolonged this X and W behind the mirror. You can see this line. And we have also prolonged the line Z, Y behind the mirror. So this purple, or blue color line, you can see I have, I have prolonged it behind the, behind the mirror. Then he says, the second student says that the distance of the object pin P from the mirror is equals to the distance of the image I from the mirror. Mayer and record the object distance and the image distance from the figure 3.2, give the unit of your answer, okay. So the object distance uh, and the image distance, we have to measure it, okay. So the, uh, the object distance is this P from the mirror. I can measure this and I can measure this. Okay, the distance of the image from the mirror. Just measure this and measure this, okay. And I have noted down that the object distance is 2.5. Uh, centimeter and the image distance is also 2.5 centimeter. He says, give a uh, state giving a reason why whether your results agree with the statement made by the student. I think. Uh, uh, uh the, the of the object from the lens and the distance of the image from the lens they both are equal to each other Uh, yes, uh, results agree with each other. Both the results are same. Okay, the distance of the image from the from the from the mirror and the distance of the object from the mirror is same. So yes, our results agree with this. So that was the question number uh, three. So let's move to the next question. 
But before going to the next question, let's have a look at the marking scheme. So my dear students, uh, the marking scheme for the question number uh, three is showing up on your screen. Uh, you can pause the video and you can take your time and you can read this marking scheme. And, and I told you all the time that it is very important to always uh, check your answers, compare them with the marking scheme issued by the Cambridge. Okay. So let's move to the next question. He says, a student connects three identical lamps P, Q, and R to a cell and a switch to make a circuit. Lamp P is connected in series with the lamp R and the switch and the cell. Lamp Q is connected in parallel with both the lamps P and R. Draw the circuit diagram. It's a one mark question. We have to draw the circuit diagram. So let me show you. Okay. So you can see here, we have drawn that circuit diagram. Here's the battery, here's that switch. P and Q, they are connected in series with each other. And the, uh, the, the lamp R has been connected parallel to both the P and the Q. So this is how you will draw. That circuit diagram, it's a one mark question. Okay, so let's go to the next part. He says, uh, the student disconnects the lamps uh, from the circuit in the figure A and, the re and reconnects them as shown in the figure 4.1. When the switch, now you have connected Q and R parallel to each other and the P is uh, in series with their combined uh, resistance. Okay, when the switch is closed, the student notices that the lamp P lights dimly and the lamp Q and R do not light. Five possible explanations for this are shown in the table. So basically this is uh, lit uh, dimly, but these two are not lit at all. So, Five possible explanations for this are shown in the table 4.1. So pick, uh, please uh, place a tick in the boxes opposite uh, to the two possible correct explanations. So all the cells need recharging. Yes, this is might be the case. That's why the light is dim and the other two lights are off. Yes, you will put a tick here. Then he says the currents in the lamp Q and R are too small. That can also be the reason the filament of the lamp L is broken. The filament of the lamps Q and R are broken. There is a break in the lead and the lead connecting the cell to the lamp Q and R. So we will put a tick and here and here. So the place a tick in the boxes opposite the two possible correct explanations. So this is the last part of this question. And by this question, the paper is also over. Let me show you my answer. So the cells need recharging, yes, and the currents in the lamp Q and R are too small. So that's why they are not lit. Okay, so uh, my dear students, uh, today we have done, today, uh, my dear students, we have done October, November, 2021, Physics 505442 paper. This paper was alternative to practical, or you can say this paper is ATP and the zone from the zone two. So today we have completed this paper. I hope that this video, you will uh, be able to understand this paper. So uh, if you think that this video is helpful to you and to you, it can be helpful to your friends, uh, don't hesitate to share the link of this video onto your Twitter accounts and onto your Facebook account and onto your uh, uh, Instagram. So because when you will do this, this will help me to promote my channel and that's like oxygen uh, for me. So uh, if you think that this video is useful, uh, also like my and subscribe my, like my video and subscribe my channel. It's a great uh, blessing for me. It's a great player for me to teach you online and to be some help to you. So uh, I will just say thank you very much once again, everybody. Have a good day and God 
bless you all.